Good evening and welcome to Drawing the Line, Redistricting Wake County. This program is brought to you by the Social Action Committee of the Raleigh Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I am Kay Webb and it is my pleasure to serve as co-chair of the Social Action Committee. This program tonight is the result of a collaborative partnership with NC Counts Coalition. We are pleased and thankful for their support and participation in this forum. So tonight we hope to provide answers to many of your questions about the redistricting process, especially where we are at present and what to expect in the future. Tonight, we will be focusing on specific efforts in Wake County. And now I present to you our president of the Raleigh Alumni Chapter. Greetings. It is an honor to come before you tonight on behalf of the 360 members of the Raleigh Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We're before you again tonight to give you more tools in your toolkit to make sure you're prepared to meet what is before us in our community. I am grateful to the co-chairs. Uh, we have Kate Webb and Donna Owens who have come before us again to make sure that we're prepared in doing this partnership tonight with the NC Counts Coalition. Thank you to the NC Counts Coalition for choosing Raleigh alumni to one, to one day be a future leader and being able to change what is currently going on in our community. Again, to our community partners and guests, thank you for continuing to support the programs of our chapter. We hope that you will join us in future programs. I hope you learn a lot tonight and that you enjoy the program. Thank you again for your support. Thank you uh, to my co-chair, Sarah K. Webb, and to our wonderful president, uh, Lydia Davis, and to all of you who are joining us tonight, drawing the lines, redistricting Wake County. And I wanna thank particularly our presenters I connected with NC Counts, I guess a couple months ago when they had a summit after the census were completed uh, to hear that data and to hear the reporting of where we were in North Carolina. And so now that those uh, census data is in, uh, our government, our legislator are in the process of drawing district lines for voting. And as we know, our voting rights have been under attack. And so tonight, what we want to share with you with this fantastic group of presenters, they will share with us where we are in Wake County. I want to present first to you, Angeline Etcher-Barrera, who is the um, Director of Community, Community Engagements. And I also want to present her partner, <laughs> Kyle Brazil Esquire, who is the Director of Civic Engagement. And last night, I participated in a a meeting, a call uh, for the partnerships last night across the state of North Carolina and uh, have been following this very, very closely. And it is something that we truly need to be paying attention to. And so as a social action committee for this uh, organization, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority here in Raleigh Alumni Chapter, it is very, very important that you hear what they have to share tonight. And that's why we opened this event up to the public. And it has now been, it is being um, broadcast, Facebook Live. And so those who are watching Facebook, so if you have your phone near you, share it, share this information so that it's not just for our sorority, but it is for our community. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Angeline and to Kyle that they may present to us this critical, important information about redistricting and Wake County. Enjoy. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be in this space with you all. And I'm very much so looking forward to providing this information to you all um, this evening to go through redistricting in the process. Just as a bit of background, um, and of course, first, thank you all so much again for having us um, and allowing us to provide these this information. NC Counts Coalition, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit 501c3 organization committed to building a healthy, just, and equitable North Carolina through cross sector partnerships. Uh, we work to advance systemic solutions for communities that are facing systemic barriers. 
including our BIPOC communities, LGBTQ plus communities, low wealth, immigrant, and other communities of North Carolina. Um, and so this evening, we have the pleasure to walk you a bit through um, redistricting work and give you all some great information on where we are as a state, what has happened so far, um, and give you those specific action items towards the end of what you can do now, given that we've gone through this process. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about census. I think all of us can agree when we were in civic class in high school or whatever class you had, you learned a lot about voting and the importance. Um, I didn't really learn much about the census until I read the constitution when I was in law school. We don't spend a lot of time about redistricting though. And so I think given where we are, there's a lot of education that we're, that's out there now and we're gonna provide some details about redistricting, talk about the process and power, speak on where we are now and talk about what it means to have and form a community of interest. Um, next slide, Angeline. And Angeline, I'm gonna pass it off to you to talk a bit about the census. Thanks so much, Kyle. And thank you all for having me. I, it's really an honor to be with you tonight. I have seen your chapter in action at candidate forums doing the census work. So I'm just glad that you're partnering with NC Counts Coalition to get engaged on redistricting as well. So I'm going to share a little bit first just about the census data that is being used for redistricting. I know that y'all participated in the get out the count efforts. And so the data that is available is a um, due in no small part to the efforts of your organization and other community groups across North Carolina. The data that we have access to now is just the redistricting data files. So it includes um, population counts, demographic data, and more specific data for voting age population over eight, 18 and up. Um, and then it includes some data on housing units and group quarters, which group quarters includes things like college dorms, prisons, folks where like congregate living settings. Um, the other thing to share is just that the Census Bureau has done some analysis of the data and um, they feel like it has been a remarkably accurate census considering the challenges that were presented under the previous administration and the pandemic. Um, we know some information based on this data, but there will be more releases of data in the coming months. And so we currently don't have data about um, the age structure and home ownership rates, things like that. Um, but there is um, going to be data released that will include information about same sex relationships, because this was the first time that that was an option to include when you were identifying the relationships between people in the household. And there will be ancestry and origin data released as well in the future. We do not have that data yet though. We just have the broad racial and ethnic categories. So the results of the census, North Carolina, we know our population has been growing. The census results demonstrate that. Um, we had almost a million new residents of North Carolina over the um, 10 year. And a lot of that growth happened in Wake County. Wake County grew 25% um, and has about 1.12 million residents currently. Um, other counties in the state, however, did lose population. So about 51 um, counties in North Carolina, 51 out of 100 lost population over the 10 years and 49 counties gained. And you saw that gain, you know, urban and suburban counties, that trend of urban and suburban counties gaining population while rural counties um, have been losing population was reflected in the results. So you'll see here the fastest growth was here in the triangle, um, areas near Charlotte and Mecklenburg County, as well as pockets um, in the area of Wilmington. And then the largest population losses have been um, in Northeastern North Carolina and in the Sand Hills region. So the census results also show a continuation of the trend of North Carolina becoming a state that is more diverse, that has different 
um, multiple ways that um, community members are identifying themselves racially and ethnically. Um, the white population is about 60% right now, Black or African American, 20%, Hispanic or Latinx, 11%. The biggest growth really has been in this multiracial category, which is in part could be due to how the questions were asked. There's a we could have a whole separate session just about how the census questions or rate um, were developed and specifically the race and ethnicity questions. Um, but we also saw tremendous growth in the um, Asian community. And then Wake County has um, demographics that somewhat mirror those of North Carolina, but is um, has a much larger Asian community than the state at large. Um, a slightly higher um, Hispanic community, slightly smaller Black community compared to the state as a whole, but overall has a um, more diverse population, less folks identifying as white in Wake County. So this just demonstrates again how the state has been diversifying. Um, so you'll see the the ways in which the um, you know non-white population has been growing over time. And then, as I mentioned before, you know the multiracial category and the some other race categories were the two that grew the most over the ten years. In part, we think because people are more willing to identify with multiple identities, but also in part because of the way the question was asked that you could check multiple options. Um, and a lot of it was very confusing for certain communities. Um, but almost all of the communities in North Carolina grew to a certain extent with the exception of um, folks identifying as American Indian. Um, actually, one more point on the census data before I kick it back to Kyle, who's going to go into the redistricting piece. Um, there is a lot of controversy about how the data is used. So these numbers are really just like if someone identified as both um, Black and white, for example, they would be put in the multiracial category which means that they also still identified as both black and white. And so they're not being reflected in the full numbers for the black community or for the full numbers for the white community. And so that is something that a lot of allies are talking about, just how are we really analyzing this data to make sure it accurately represents how people are identifying. And so there's a lot more work to be done. These are just the top level summarized results that are being used for the purpose of redistricting. Um, so I'll send it over to Kyle now. Thank you, Angeline. And so we have to get a bit into the weeds on redistricting, but I think it's important to first note, um, we can't get to redistricting unless we have census, right? Um, and so it's a, a very crucial component of the work that we're doing, um, and it's all tied together. Um, in particular, just as an example, right, New York, um, they lost uh, a seat uh, for, for the U.S. Congress because they had 86 fewer people in their census count. And so they lost, the state of New York lost one congressional seat because of that reason. Um, and I was in a conference call with an expert talking about New York, um, and they said and spoke up and said that a lot of the changes and issues that they saw um, for New York was based off of COVID, right? And so that those 86 and losing that one congressional seat was tied directly to the deaths um, from the pandemic. So it's all tied together. It's tied to health equity, it's tied to our issues, it's tied to a lot of the things that we're doing. And so it's at our core. Um, redistricting is the congressional representation, it's the electoral college votes, um, and it's also the lines. And so we have a state like North Carolina with about seven to 8 million uh, adults who are eligible to vote. Um, if you look at the numbers, and, and this is coming from um, UNC Demography, Carolina Demography Group, um, about 36% are registered Democrats, 33% unaffiliated, 30% Republican. And so we very much so, we have a purple state. 
Um, but there's ways that you can use this data and draw these lines that are not beneficial um, and can hurt some of the communities that we work really hard to protect. Um, Angeline, the next slide, please. So what exactly is redistricting, right? Redistricting is a process that occurs every 10 years. It's supposed to only occur 10 years, um, where we, based off of population changes, um, as we saw from Angeline's slides, um, where we have urban areas have grown, rural areas have declined in population, we have to redraw the districts because these districts become uneven in size. Um, and in order to make sure we have fair representation, we're redrawing the districts and we're doing redistricting to make sure we have an equal population count or as close as possible uh, in size um, among all of the districts. So that's what redistricting is. In North Carolina, you all are well aware though with the court cases that go on, we probably actually do redistricting work every year or two. Um, but in an ideal world, uh, we're only supposed to do it every 10 years. Next slide, Angeline. So done right, redistricting is a chance to create maps um, that in the words of John Adams have an exact portion, a portrait, a miniature of the people as a whole. And why redistricting is important, North Carolina did gain an additional congressional seat. So we will have a 14th seat um, moving forward. And you all see um, th this was, th these were, this is the population of the old uh, maps that we had in North Carolina. And so off of the 13, um, what we do is we took that 13, right? Well, we took the entire population. We now have 14 uh, congressional districts. We divide that evenly and it comes up to about 745,000. And so you'll see there is a huge deviation from 745. Um, and so every district this cycle had to be changed, had to be re redrawn. And so oftentimes um, what we're looking at in, in these every 10 years is the opportunity to make sure we're keeping communities whole, that we're keeping voices together. Angeline, next slide, please. How and where districts are drawn They'll shape the community's ability to elect their representatives of choice. Districts must be made as equal in population, as I stated. And then when manipulated, redistricting can take away minority voting rights. And that gets us to gerrymandering um, and the issues with gerrymandering. Elected officials can sometimes manufacture election outcomes that are detached from our preference as voters, right? And so rather than voters choosing their representatives, what we can have in some systems, um, gerrymandering, it allows politicians to choose their voters, right? And so that's where gerrymandering is bad. Um, and there's two components of it. There's one that in North Carolina and across the country is not allowed, and that is racial gerrymandering. Um, and in North Carolina, we'll get to the example, but in North Carolina, we have been told by the courts that the districts were racially gerrymandered with surgical precision. Um, and so it, it can become a huge issue and a huge pro a problem for a lot of the populations um, that we represent, that we are a part of. And those gerrymandered political maps, they either dilute the power of the people or they don't allow the people to elect the candidate of their choice. When that happens, there's partisan concerns. Um, and those partisan concerns invariably take precedence over all else um, and not the concerns of the people, right? Um, next slide, Angela. So the famous, one of the two famous examples for gerrymandering was what happened at a and campus. a and was cracked in half to dilute the power. And so when that happened, you had students you know, in, in, in alphas who were in the same fraternity in the same dorm, um, and they were voting on different sides of town, right? Um, you had a community where they could have elected the representatives of their choice, and now their power is diluted. And so this is a clear instance of gerrymandering by cracking. It's when you have a concentrated population and you split that district um, in half. Another example 
um, that we have, Angeline, on the next slide is where we get to packing. And packing is another example. Um, and it can't on the surface seem like a good thing. But what we had in North Carolina with the 12 district, we had an instance where the lines were drawn and they stretched all the way from Mecklenburg County to almost Durham County. Um, the district was about 64% African-American and the candidate was winning the district um, by margins of about 84% of the vote, right? And so, you know, it, the idea of it, it, for some people, right, we wanna make sure we have a candidate for African-Americans. Um, and so they thought this 12th district, let's pack all of the African-Americans together and, and have this salamander snake district go all the way up. I would argue though, that that is really problematic. I think number one, the concerns that are going on in Mecklenburg are not the concerns as you snake up to those rural areas. And they're definitely not the concerns as you go to Forsyth um, and then Guilford County, right? Um, and so you have one representative addressing all those concerns when the concerns of the people you know, are, are various. The second issue though, that I see is that, I mean, in portions of this map, this is surgical precision, in portions of the map, this, these lines are no wider than the interstate that it's making up, right? And you could have potentially had two, maybe three African-American candidates being elected from the way this was gerrymandered. If you allowed Forsyth to stay whole and Greensboro uh, to stay whole, there could have been two or three African-American elected officials, as opposed to just making sure that one is there. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily give the people the opportunity to have the candidate of choice, right? If you have someone who is embedded in that system, they're winning by margins of 84%, they're probably not campaigning as hard, they're probably not going out to the community and talking to the folks in the community as much. And so this is an example of packing and one of the things that we must fight um, as we fight for, for fair maps and redistricting. Next slide. So these were the maps that we have. Um, and we had these maps up until about a week or two ago. Um, we, of course, these are the North Carolina's congressional maps and it says current on there, but you know, this was, this is just now as of a couple weeks ago, um, the former maps, you see district one, um, and we all know, of course, um, GK Butterfield, we see 12 down here. We see how nine snaked around, um, took a little bit about, uh, from Mecklenburg and then came on south and so that was the previous map next slide Angeline. and so moving to those next maps that we are about to look at um, it's crucial to make sure you all are aware who holds authority in this process in north carolina in this process under the constitution the power of course is with the people the way that that comes to us right it's through our legislators and so this is a process in north carolina one of the few um, states in the nation that still has complete and total authority vested in the legislature. The governor of North Carolina does not have a veto. Um, and so this is something that the legislature, the General Assembly will do through ratification. Um, they will, um, through resolution, adopt the bill and they have done that. Um, and the governor has no say in that. I mean, it's interesting to note that the governor, when he was in the General Assembly, um, he was one of the folks who uh, was a part of the bill and, you know, negotiated taking that away for the governor's, um, taking that veto authority away from the governor's office. And so right now it is solely vested in the legislature. And so the maps that we often see um, reflect the makeup of the legislature itself. Next slide, Angeline. And so throughout the process, um, and to get you all up to where we are, um, we've had the opportunity to have online and in-person public comments and hearings. Um, prior to that in August, the legislature, they adopted a set of criteria that they said that they would use to draw the maps. Um, they drew the maps in chambers in open sessions uh, throughout the month of October. And they passed the bill for three maps in North Carolina um, just a few weeks ago. Um, right before they passed those maps, 
um, there were several lawsuits. There was one that was filed on Friday uh, from um, a group that's affiliate, affiliated with North Carolina De Democratic Party. There was another lawsuit that was filed a bit before that um, by North Carolina um, NAACP, as well as um, Common Cause and four individual plaintiffs. And so within that litigation, um, they are, from my reading of it, in part attacking the criteria and talking and saying essentially that a lot of the criteria was not proper. Angeline, next slide, please. And so the criteria that the legislature adopted, um, a large portion of this is equal population, right? And I said that earlier. Um, redistricting is to make sure that the areas that have grown and the areas that have lost population, you try to bring all these districts together and draw lines so that you have equal population. Um, in these factors that they adopted though, right? And there was never an indication of whether that this list was in priority. They put community consideration at the bottom and I'll talk a bit about community consideration and communities of interest and what that means. They did include that their member residents can be taken into account. And so um, that gets to the idea of double bunking and triple bunking where members can consider where they live in respect to where the districts and the lines are drawn. Um, but they, they said one interesting thing um, when they passed this criteria that racial data um, would not be considered. And so we have a process that did not allow our legislators to use any racial data. On one side, folks said, well, that will ensure that things are fair. On the other side, though, of the argument, um, there is a call and there's a requirement under case law and the law that we consider for the Voting Rights Act. And we make sure we are drawing lines um, so that we are not disenfranchising, historically disenfranchised um, populations, African-American populations, indigenous populations. And so without racial data, the argument is, and in, in some of this litigation that's coming through, the argument is you did not use that data, you did not have that data. And so how do you know if you are drawing this under the Voting Rights Act without having that data at all? Next slide, Angela. And so the one thing that you all can do now, and we'll talk about this in a bit for action items, um, share your community of interest, talk to the folks in your community um, and share with us um, your concerns within your community and really define that. A community of interest is a neighborhood or area whose residents have shared culture, history, and policy concerns. And so as we talk about bringing people together in this space, and as we talk about redistricting, there are a lot of issues that resound that intersect where we are, be it education, and, and we see some of the bills that are getting passed um, for that in, in various states across the country, health equity, and, and we have the example of what happened in New York, but there's a lot of intersection between how we draw these lines and where authority is. And so you all defining your community of interest, talking about shared culture, history, and policy concerns, um, and making sure that you fight to keep your communities whole. That's perhaps one of the most important things we can do throughout this process. Next slide. Angela. And so just to go through some of these maps, um, this is the congressional map as we have now. Um, and so this is how it has now been drawn. Um, there are a lot of wonderful resources out there and I'm gonna link one of them in chat so you all have it. Um, and we will also share this presentation with you all so that you can see these links. Uh, one of the really great tools out there is the Princeton um, Gerrymandering um, Project. They've gone through and they've graded the maps that have now come through. They graded the draft maps and now these three final maps that we have. Um, the congressional map that you're looking at they gave it an F for partisan fairness, a C for competitiveness, and a C for geographic features. Um, Angeline, if you could stop sharing your screen and then I will share my screen really quickly so you all can see it. And so to overlay the map, right? If you look at the way the maps were drawn, and we talked about gerrymandering, we talked about the way you can draw a map, right? Um, so that it may benefit you 
um, for partisanship, or it may dilute the Black vote, right? Um, we see here that North Carolina is decidedly red. Um, we have some competitive districts here. Uh, this is District 4, which would include Fayetteville. It's light red, which means it's leaning um, towards Republican, but it could potentially be competitive. Um, we also have here a light blue. And um, I think it's important to note, right? I don't, I don't think G.K. Butterfield would ever have to fight as hard as he may have to fight in the upcoming election. Um, but we see how they drew this map in this way. And so it's leaning Democrat, but um, it's a light blue. Uh, we see here, and, and I know the county lines aren't on here, so it may be difficult to tell, but um, Greensboro um, and its county here, of course, uh, we have Greensboro there, it was split into three. And so a lot of the areas were kept whole, but it's important to note the triad is completely red, right? Um, and a portion of that red is the fact that Greensboro in that area was split into three separate districts. If we come over to Wake County and you know I'm in Durham, we see Durham was grouped over here with Orange. Um, we see Chatham um, County here was grouped with Alamance and Randolph. And we see Southern Wake County coming out and being split off into the, the grouping with Chatham and Alamance. Um, we also see here that uh, there is a double bunking here. We see here in Charlotte, um, we, we have this area in Charlotte that was highlighted in blue, but Charlotte has been slightly split. And so there's portions of Charlotte that now go to this eighth district. There's portions of Charlotte that go to this 13th and then this 10th district. Um, and so this is the way the maps were drawn. But again, I just wanna remind you, right? In this process, seven to 8 million registered voters in North Carolina, we have you know, a purple state. We have 33% unaffiliated, 36% um, or so registered Democrats and 30% Republican. And so I'm positive that there are ways to draw this map 30 different ways to get out of this partisanness, you know, this partisanship um, and this fairness grade of being an F. Um, but this is just, I think, a great representation of where we are um, in this state. This is one of the many tools that is, that's out there for you all to view, to analyze. Um, and it's an important tool. Angelina, I'm gonna let you go back to your screen. Thank you so much. And so just two additional maps. I won't go into as much detail because I feel like I've sucked up all the air and, and been talking the entire time. So Angelina, I wanna give you a chance to speak up again and talk in the next few slides. But we have the state house map um, as well as the state Senate map. And you all can see how these districts and lines um, were drawn. I think there's a bit of, um, on the congressional side, there, there was some double bunking and there were some, you know, political officials who were pulled together in some of their districts um, with their home address. Uh, a lot of the resolutions that I saw passed and, and some of the amendments to um, the way things were being drawn um, over the last few weeks were to make sure people weren't being double bunked, uh, but we have the state and the house map there for you all. And I can take your questions about some of this stuff um, in a bit. Angeline, I'm gonna let you start back up and handle this slide. Okay. Um, so in addition to the tool that Kyle shared with you all um, to evaluate the partisan gerrymandering and the competitiveness, the Princeton Gerrymandering Project, this is an analysis that was done by um, the um, North Carolina Common Cause using an app or a program called Dave's Redistricting. And they did an analysis of each of the maps. And so if you, once we share these slides, you can go to each of those links and see not just um, the kind of overview that the gerrymandering project provides, but also specific information about the demographic makeup of each of the districts and how um, it relates. This app does not provide an analysis of the Voting Rights Act, but it does allow you to um, 
you know, see what districts are, you know, majority of certain demographics and kind of compare how they're broken up. And so they did an analysis for each of the maps. Um, they also analyzed all of the draft maps in addition to this, but these are just the three maps that were actually passed. So these are additional tools that can help you with your map analysis. The one that um, Kyle already uh, did the demonstration of. The second tool there, it's called redistricting and you, that one actually helps you compare, like if you put in your address, you can compare what your district was previously to what it will be under the new maps that have been passed. We also have a toolkit that um, NC Counts Coalition has developed that includes a lot of um, resources from our partner organizations as well as national organizations. Um, and then there are two additional programs there that are free programs that are available on the internet that you can use to either map the communities or the districts you wish you would have had or to analyze districts that have already been drawn. Um, so we already talked a lot about the way, oh, and one thing I did just want to note is that the congressional map also divides Wake County into three separate congressional districts. Um, so it's certainly going to have an impact locally. Um, in addition to the congressional district and the state legislative districts that Kyle already spoke about, um, we have new Board of Commissioners districts. The town of Cary has passed new districts, and then the city of Raleigh and the Wake County Board of Education are going to be doing redistricting. So I'll share a little bit of information, what we know so far. So the Wake County Board of Commissioners passed their new maps on November 1st. Their maps are um, interesting because they actually have what's called residence districts where even though the commissioners must live in the district that they are running in, they are voted on by all of the voters in the county. And so uh, when they passed the maps, they also made a decision to vote to restore four year staggered terms for commissioners. The current commissioners were elected to two year terms, but they are going to, um, about half of them will, continue for another two years without having been elected to a four year term. Um, and then the other half will, you know, run for reelection next year and um, but be running for a four year term, even though they previously did two year terms, but it will be staggered. So it won't be the way that it's been over recent years that you could potentially have a full um, overturning of the commission in one uh, election cycle. Um, they did have some public hearings and an online public comment portal, as well as um, that website that is linked there. There were less than 20 public comments between the online and um, in-person comments um, for, you know, a county of over a million people. Uh, so I would have liked to see a personally a more robust public engagement process, but this is um, what we got. And they did actually make some modifications to the process in response to pressure from uh, local groups. Um, and then, you know, everything continues as planned. The candidate filing will start in December and the um, elections will be in March. The town of Cary also passed new maps. They passed them on November 9th and the link to the new maps is there. They provided more options. They had two different options that community members could comment on. Um, there were in the first, the notes I could find online that there were three public comments. There may have been more at the actual meeting where they voted on the maps, um, but not as much public engagement. Although I will say that the town of Cary provided a lot more information about the current districts and the process, at least online, than the um, Board of Commissioners did. And they're also looking at um, March elections for town of Cary. The city of Raleigh, this is actually not, I needed to have updated this slide because they did have a discussion about the process at their city council meeting last week. Um, they had one 
town hall meeting that was on Zoom, um, but they haven't had any public hearings yet. And they plan to have the study committee that's been studying the city council terms and compensation um, to manage this process and play a role in this process. They're going to have um, city staff draw the maps and come up with three different options. They have not stated what the criteria will be, but that the study committee, when they come up with the three options with staff, will provide um, like pros and cons of each of the different options. Um, and in addition, they are planning on having three public hearings as well as an online public comment portal um, and plan on finishing up the process around March 1st because their deadline to submit maps is March 31st. Um, they're not planning on changing the number of districts at this point, just redrawing the, the current number of districts. And so hopefully they'll be coming out with dates for public hearings in the near future um, so that um, you all can be involved in that process. The Wake Board of Education has hired con a consulting firm to draw the maps for them. They are going to have three different options of maps. Um, but they haven't shared what the approved criteria will be or whether or not pros and cons will be shared the way that the city of Raleigh is planning on sharing. Um, they haven't set any dates for public hearings yet, but they did say that the Board of Education is planning to discuss the process again, either late this year or one of their first meetings in 2022. Um, they are working around the same deadline of March 31st for their map. Kyle, I think that you're gonna cover this part. Absolutely. And thank you, Angeline. And I wanna tell you all, I think a portion of this is just recognizing that this work is not done, right? Um, this is no longer every 10 years. Um, I think it's contingent on us, right? In order to fight for fair maps in order to get fair maps um, and make sure that we're picking our political figures and not the other way around, they're not picking their constituents, that we stay involved and engaged. One of the ways that you all can continue to stay engaged, um, and we'll give you the information for this in the next slide, um, we are collecting still comments. And so it's no longer um, an option on the General Assembly's website. Um, and so the time for public comments has come and gone in the process and they have pushed you know, the maps that they want there's still ongoing litigation. Um, but what we're doing is coalition building, we're framing what we need to do, and, and we're making sure we have a narrative so that our stories of our communities are told um, so that we can speak on the fact that Wake County was split three ways and it was split in such a way um, so that there was partisan advantage and potentially violations of the Voting Rights Act. We can talk about what's going on in Greensboro and in Charlotte in a way um, that informs and tells our story. And so getting to that public comment, um, it's not a heavy list, a lift. It's introducing yourself and your organization. It's tailoring it to your goals, your thoughts on what a fair map is. You can also talk a bit about the process. Um, and so for example, in this process, we had public hearings, those public hearings, the vast majority of them, um, you know, started during the day or right at the end of the day, did not allow for folks who are working um, or, you know, who may have kids like myself to be able to go. Um, they also, we only had 13 public hearings before we had draft maps as opposed to 62 in the last cycle. Um, and then as they were drawing maps, we had two more hearings that were announced the Thursday before uh, the Monday and two hearings without actually having the maps that they were going to vote on, right? We were commenting on draft maps that weren't actually the draft maps that they were considering. We did not know what the maps were gonna look like, but they still held two more hearings. And so, you know, you can talk about transparency. You can also speak on the fact that there is clear partisanship um, in a state where, you know, it's evident that we are a purple state. We also encourage you to tell your story. Um, and then we've given you all a ton of resources. So as you feel comfortable, add data. 
talk a bit about the census, talk a bit about your community. And, and if you need assistance pulling out that data, um, I assisted one young lady who just wanted to get a sense of well, how many how many people with kids are in Durham right now and, and give me some more population so I can talk a bit about you know schools because that's what was important to her. Um, we may be able to help you and if we can't we can probably point you in the right direction, but it's all about making sure you tell your story and you get us that um, public comment next slide Angeline. And so. The call to action here, we've listed two. There's probably, there are many more things that you all can do. And so we can help you strategize and think through what you all wanna do next as an organization or as individuals. Um, the two that we've listed that are really important, listen and share local information. You know, NC Counts, there's just a few of us and there's a lot more people on the ground, right? There's people who are embedded, um, who, you know, we've got in all of our networks, we know people who are principals of schools and are hearing things, folks who work in various um, different areas of the state. Um, and so listen and share local information, tell us what's going on. That's often the best way for us to find out about it and then plug it so that people can try to get out and get that information. Unfortunately, for, for so long, the information that we've had was sort of hushed, right? It was on a website here and you really had to dig it dig it out. Um, and similar to educating you all on redistricting, we're doing this work when in fact, you know, quite frankly, the, the elected officials should be educating folks on what this is all about. And so listen and share information so we can share it with other folks and we can continue to get the word out about redistricting and educate each other. And then we are calling it the people's hearings. Um, it is a video comment. We're uploading them to YouTube and we're collecting stories, shared stories from across the state about redistricting, about individual issues. Um, I spoke with a uh, with, um, great guy, um, Robert, uh, who's down in Charlotte today, and he was talking a bit about preemption and Charlotte issues and all of that. And we were able to record that and I did that over Zoom. So we're collecting video comments, we're asking people to submit them to us, and we're producing a narrative around it. Um, we're producing um, several shorts that'll give a sense of this is redistricting in North Carolina. Um, this was the process we were given, but this is what we truly deserve. And we deserve fair maps that are representative of the people, not representative of people who want to stay in power. Um, and so just want to say thank you all. I want to open it up to questions as well. Um, there's a lot that is going on in this space. And so a portion of the work that we've been doing at NC Counts is to try to connect the, all the pieces from the various organizations that are working. And so we have a redistricting roundtable event. Um, Della, thank you for coming out yesterday uh, to that. Um, we have weekly meetings, um, talk about advocacy and, and comms and, and just the nature of the work. So it is ongoing and redistricting again is not every 10 years. It is something we have to think about um, and really educate each other about because far too long, you know, it's been a game of hide the ball. We didn't get this as a part of history class, right? This is a way where folks can dilute our power and our authority in this country and in this state. And so we've got to educate ourselves, educate our young people about what redistricting is so that we can change this tide because once we change this tide, the census really matters. And then who we're voting for, we're voting for the people that we've decided we want to elect and not the other way around. So thank you all. We are waiting to see if there are any questions. So this is an opportunity to ask questions uh, from our panelists who has given us some great information. And uh, some of you have asked whether or not the presentation you've heard it, it will be shared. So you'll get all the uh, juicy details of what they shared tonight. But are there questions? Um, sorry, K Webb is going to be lifting those up. If you want to just put them in the chat, we will um, get your questions answered tonight. So um, and again, the link is there. Uh, I want to say, too, for the call of action, I, I think I did my video a couple of days ago. It only took me about, about two minutes. I try not to be very long. I uh, had to record it a couple of times. But 
please, uh, I see that we got 22 people on the line, but if you do it and you get one more person, that's 44 people. And we can just do those numbers quickly, just like that. So if you would just commit to those that are here to put this call to action, uh, and this is something we need to do to address this issue. You've heard this is an ongoing issue. Let's not think that just because the census data is in, that is over. It is gonna be uh, a battle and we need to roll up our sleeves as we do as a sorority and get in the fight. So please, please, this, we're making a call to action, do the video, make your comments. Um, and again, if you go to that toolkit, they're willing to help you do it. <laughs> you can do it via your phone, you can do it your laptop, uh, just gotta be steady with the, with, the, with the cell phone. But again, uh, that is the call to action. Do we have any questions from anybody? Uh, no questions yet in the chat. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, I say in school, it seems as though you must have uh, covered your information very well, Angeline and Kyle. So uh, great presentation. Um, I want to thank uh, again uh, my co-chair, uh, Kay Webb. I want to thank the uh, Social Action uh, Committee as well for being on uh, tonight. I want to thank our uh, fabulous president, uh, Lillian Davis, our chaplain, she's on, Deborah McCord, thank you. And some of the other committee members are here. I know that Georgia uh, Marcella was also on the round table conversation last night as well. So uh, thank you for joining. So I'm just checking, making sure there are no questions. Uh, comments. Again, this event has been recorded and I want to thank my line sister who's behind the camera uh, working IT for us tonight and got everything set up. And again, this is Facebook Live, so share it out uh, that more people will be informed about what's uh, going on, particularly here, those who live in Wake County, you got some, if you live in Cary, you've gotten that information and use those tools the map so that you can kind of look and see where you are and where you live and there's been changes and uh, where you will be positioned based on the map. And I know there's some questions that popped up, so I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Ms. Webb to lift up those couple of questions um, that's in the chat. Uh, yes. Um, First question is, is there a deadline to get the videos down? Not sure. So thank you for that question. So um, I'm saying ASAP, <laughs> send it to us as soon as you can. We did have an initial goal of Friday, um, but we're still collecting them and we're still getting some in. So we're gonna keep it open. Um, the goal is to have something, you know, a narrative very early in December edited. Um, so if you could please just get it to us quickly so we can make sure not only do you send it to us and we can post it on YouTube, but portions of your video could be edited into something else um, that we use. All right, another question is, where would you suggest someone start in advocating? There are uh, some great question. I, I think there are a lot of options. I would start though, with making sure you are, you feel educated and there's a lot of resources and tools. Um, so number one, and, and you know, we've really started on this tonight, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there was a collaboration um, of several organizations, including NC Counts, um, North Carolina Black Alliance, Asian Americans Together. It was a code red project. And so there's more trainings. If you go to our toolkit, you can see that. And so I would start with education. Once you feel comfortable to talk about it, right? And give us a call. We're happy to talk to you about it because um, this is all we do some days. Um, I would say that next step is to absolutely engage with your legislator, right? And so a portion of this is that the process has ended um, in, in terms of there being a vote on it, but we're in the middle of litigation. They're likely going to be knock on wood successful in some of this litigation. The process may restart. And so making sure your legislators know that this is something that you're interested in, this is something that you're passionate about, and you don't approve of how it was handled, right? Um, making sure you provide that information. In addition to that, 
the process on the state level has those maps have been passed, but the city of Raleigh is just starting their process and the Wake um, County Board of Education as well. And oftentimes you can have more of an impact. I mean, I'm looking at what happened in Cary. We're talking about three public comments. If this chapter mobilized to, you know, get comments for the city of Raleigh redistricting process or the Wake County Board of Education, you could really have a tremendous impact on making sure that those districts are drawn fairly and that, um, you know, it's a transparent process. So I would just encourage you also to think about sometimes on the hyper local level, you can have more of an impact than say on the state level at times. And particularly, you know, at this moment in the process on the state level, really what you can do is understand these maps that have been passed, like use these tools to try to see what does this mean for my community? You know, where do you live in Wake County? What district, what's your old district? What's your new district? You know, making sure that folks in your community understand we have new districts, right? Because that I think election time, that's always a thing, you know, helping people to understand who's on the ballot. I know that you all coordinate candidate forums, so you know how, how challenging that can be. So starting sooner rather than later, just to even understand the districts is also a good first step. Okay, we have an additional question. How do we get high school students engaged, interested in this process as they begin to reach the voting age? I think that's a wonderful question. Um, and I would say similar to some of the things that we do for voting and census, um, we have to reach out to them. The other portion though is um, a lot of those conversations are finally starting to kick off. I feel as though for so long, right? And I've used this analogy several times in meetings, redistricting has been, you know, the, the, the monster in the forest that no one knows about and no one knows and it just swoops in every 10 years and then goes back in the forest. And I think, um, especially from some of the comments of the legislators um, who said, wow, there's a lot of people talking about this right now. We just have to continue this push. Um, in the space that we facilitate, there are individuals and organizations that are talking about, you know, specifics on how do we do that? How do we also reach out to our older population and bridge the gap so that, you know, all of the hard fought victories that they gained in the 90s, right? And in the 2000s that they keep voting and that we keep them engaged now on this redistricting front. And so there are organizations that are doing it. Um, and, I, and I think, um, Jessica, the question then goes back to you is, is really, how do we get high school students involved? Because it's it's not gonna be in seat counts, like we'll provide all the materials, but you know, it's gonna be the deltas, right? And then as soon as you all do it, the AKAs are gonna try to do it because they wanna, you know, they wanna beat you all at it, right? And so everyone's gonna, gonna you know, push it together. Um, and so really it starts with you all. I, I think that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing. And we're happy to support that and provide those resources and absolutely Delta educators rock. I had a lot of Delta educators in my life. So absolutely. <laughs> and I'll add one additional piece um, to what Kyle was sharing regarding how to engage young people or help young people understand how this impacts them. One of the our partners, I can't remember who brought it up at the redistricting roundtable yesterday was mentioning how the fact that elected officials are using um, a criteria that protects their power, that protects where they literally live, like making sure where my house is still in the district is a way for people who are already in power, which right now, if you look at the makeup of our North Carolina General Assembly, it's folks who um, the average age is much older than the average age of folks who are interested in politics in North Carolina, right? And so, it, this incumbency protection criteria specifically shuts the door for young people who, you know, high school age, college age, who want to run for office, want to consider running for office. It creates an extra barrier for them. And that was a perspective that I hadn't thought of too much, but it really is like we talk about 
wanting to encourage civic engagement and youth participation. But when we set up criteria so that it protects the people who are already there, it's shutting a door and shutting an avenue out, shutting people out from an avenue that they could have to get involved. So that's just another point that might be helpful to consider. Okay, don't see any additional questions at this moment. Um, thank you for the vital information, says one comment. So again, we do appreciate you coming and bringing us this wealth of information. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, there we have it. There we have it. We will get this PowerPoint presentation to you that has all the links to the maps and all the toolkits and all the resources that you need. You know, one of the things I was thinking about uh, for this youth piece, you know, we have a, a young, a lot of our gyms and ed youth educational programs is probably one of the places we as a sorority can definitely start uh, with our youth and sharing uh, uh, this to them now <laughs> while they're in those programs on our end. But it is a lot of work to do, but I think it's just, just continue to nitpick, as you, if you will, at it and stay engaged, go to those meetings and just be on alert when the hearings are open and available for Raleigh particular, we can be at those meetings and make our voices heard when they have a link to say, hey, you can post your comments, you can post your comments. But for now, we know we can send those videos to Cal and Angeline, right? Uh, just don't have to be long, introduce yourself and tell why, why, you, why is this important to you? What's the goal, what you wanna see in the process as they continue to draw these maps. Um, so again, thank you all. It, it, it was very insightful session tonight. Uh, now the real work begins, you're right. So thank you for that gathering. And the real work begins. And that is why as a social action committee, again, we wanted to host this share it with you, that you're well-informed, that you can inform yourselves, uh, your neighbors, your family, and do the work that's necessary. We know that national, the convention, if you got the notes, uh, will also be doing something redistricting and taking a, a call to action in Georgia. So it is something we should be doing. So I'm glad everybody's ready to work. And uh, I'm gonna see if our president has any closing remarks and uh, after she, shares her closing remarks. I again say thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Angeline. Thank you so much, Kyle, uh, for taking the time they shared with our committee last month and agreed to come back <laughs> to share with us at, a, at the larger group. And so we're gonna push this out. So just because uh, our numbers may not be as big as we wanna, but a lot of people are watching. I'm gonna send you those numbers to let you know how many people watched and viewed it uh, on our Facebook as well. So again, thank you. I appreciate the Social Action Committee and I appreciate uh, President uh, Davis for allowing us the opportunity to have this event tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to our hand to give a final closing remarks and uh, thank you. Thank you. I think we've learned a wealth of knowledge tonight and we will make sure as a chapter to share it with the community Again, to Kay Webb and Della Owens and to the NC Counts Coalition, thank you again for taking the time to come back to us tonight to make sure we're educated on what we need to do. And so I know where even as a citizen of Wake County, I need to start. So again, thank you and to our community partners and guests for joining us tonight. Have a good evening, everyone.